Hello and welcome to the Katie Helper Show. I'm your host, Katie Helper. Uh, this is a very special co-broadcast that I'm going to be doing with Brianna Joy Gray of the Bad Faith Podcast. I see that my camera is blurry. Um, I'll try to fix that shortly. Let's see if this trick works. Mm, not really. Yes. Okay. So um, starting all over, welcome to the Katie Helper Show. Welcome to a special joint stream where I'm going to be joined by Brianna Joy Gray, and she and I are going to co-host a discussion with the wonderful Norman Finkelstein and Muin Rabani. Crystal Ball was going to join, but she has a sick kid uh, who she has to tend to, so she won't be joining. Uh, she sends her regards, though. And um, before I get started, just a reminder to please like the chat, like the stream, subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. We're at 170,000, which is great. Uh, let's get those numbers up there because that helps the algorithm. And uh, given what we're covering on this show, I think it's really important. There's so much propaganda out there. It's really important to debunk that. And that's what we're doing on the show, especially um, this show tonight. Um, you can also become Patreon members at patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. Again, that's patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. And you get great extra content. It also just lets the show happen. We really couldn't do the show without your Patreon support. So thank you so much to everyone who is a Patreon supporter. And I'm going to bring on Brianna Joy Gray. And then I'm going to bring on our special guest. But first, my special co-host, Brianna Joy Gray, who is a host of, Risings, uh, of Rising on the Hill and also the host of the Bad Faith Podcast. Welcome, Brie. Thanks, Katie. It's always a pleasure to be included in something like this with such uh, esteemed guests in particular, including well, yourself. Joining. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You've been doing great work over at uh, the Hill. I can't believe you're still there. <laughs> you well, and me both, back. sister. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But um, yeah, I want to thank you for uh, doing all the coverage that you have been doing about this issue. You've been getting a lot of heat for it. So congrats on not backing down. Yeah, no, I think it's the very least one can do uh, with a platform like that. And I will continue to use the platform to the best of my ability to talk about this issue in particular, which um, is not treated fairly, as we all know, in mainstream media, as long as it'll allow me to do so. So right. Good. it's the very, the very least I can do. I like to think of myself as the Mark Lamont Hill to your Peter Beiner, because he, of course, was fired <laughs> by CNN, but then CNN brought on... Uh, Peter Beiner. So, yeah, so you, um, you walked so that I could run. <laughs> and yeah, someday yeah, yeah. I'll have run so that someone else can fly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, well, let's bring on our guests um, who we're so excited to be bringing on to the show. Uh, none other than Muin Rabani and Norman Finkelstein. Uh, they're both return guests. Muin Rabani is a Palestinian analyst. He's contributing editor of Middle East Report, was a senior analyst of the Middle East with the International Crisis Group and previously worked as Palestine director of the Palestinian American Research Center. He is co-editor of Jadalaya Ezine and host of the Connections podcast. So welcome, Muin. Thank you. It's very good to be with you. Thanks for joining. Pleasure. And of course, of course, we're being joined also by Norman Finkelstein, a political scientist, the author of many books that have been translated into 60 foreign editions, including The Holocaust Industry, Reflections on the Exploitation of Jewish Suffering, and Gaza, an Inquest into Martyrdom. In the year 2020, Norman Finkelstein was named the fifth most influential political scientist in the world. So welcome, Norman. Thank you for having me. Of course. So we are going to be starting off, we're going to be talking about a bunch of different things, but we're going to start off talking about uh, South Africa's case against Israel, uh, their genocide case against Israel at the IGCJ, the International Court of Justice, which took place earlier this month. And the issue, uh, the ruling will be issued uh, shortly. It's it's any day now, really. So I want to just start off by asking uh, you, Norm and Muin, about your assessment and impressions of the ICJ hearing. Moeen, would you like to begin? After you, Norm. Okay, thank you. Um, I have spent the past few days reading and rereading and rereading again the relevant documents. Everything is available except one document, 
which the Israeli side submitted to the court, but didn't make available to the general public. Uh, and that seems to be almost entirely documents uh, from its own government and from various government agencies. And that's actually a point to which I would like to return in a moment. I would say the first submission, what's called the application of the South African government, um, it runs to 84 pages and it's extremely impressive. It's not only impressive, uh, but even someone like myself who thought I knew everything backwards and forwards, up and down, I learned from it. I myself was somewhat surprised at its description of the great march of return in 2018. I was surprised by how many people were injured. I think it ran to something like 15,000 people were injured. I was not aware of that figure. Uh, and also the descriptions. And there's, there were many heartbreaking details. However, leaving aside the emotive aspect, what was most compelling, and that was brought to my attention by Crystal Bull, is the fact that the ICJ is the official juridical body of the United Nations. And virtually all the documentation, those voluminous, those hundreds of footnotes, came from UN agencies. Which means if you find against South Africa, you're finding against virtually every agency affiliated with the United Nations, because all of the documentation comes from UN agencies. So that puts a special burden on the justices, the judges in the ICJ, that they would not only be rebuffing the South African delegation, but they would be rebuffing UNRWA, its director, Mr. Lazzarini, it would be rebuffing the Under Secretary for Humanitarian Affairs, uh, Michael Griffiths, Griffiths. They would be rebuffing the Secretary General, Gutierrez, who made a lot of very strong statements. I myself was very surprised because the General Secret Secretary Generals are often terrified of saying anything strong in this subject because of the obvious reason the United States is going to. Uh, express a strong dissent. So that was its strength, in my opinion. The weakness, uh, and I discussed it at some length with Muin, he can confirm what we've already discussed or, you know, dis disagree with me. The main weakness in the uh, South African position is this. The ICJ has to uphold the rights of every party to the conflict. So obviously the Gazans have the right not to be the subject of a genocide. That's straightforward. So the, South, the ICJ could find that Israel is committing a genocide and we have the right to make, take provisional measures to prevent Israel from carrying on a genocide. The main provisional measure that South Africa wants is a ceasefire. But the ceasefire would only restrict Israel. Hamas is not a party to the proceedings. And Israel's response is, if you impose a ceasefire on us, it's unilateral and therefore you are denying us our right of self-defense. And I think that's a strong argument because there's a consensus that Israel has the right to self-defense at bare minimum, at bare minimum until the hostages are ret returned, but also the claim that they want to dismantle Hamas. Many people accept that as a legitimate war aim. And the question then is, 
how do you restrict Israel's right to fight, namely impose a ceasefire on it, without also restricting its quote unquote inalienable right to self defense? And that's going to be a very difficult problem for the ICJ, not in the question of whether there is a plausible case for genocide. I think we can go into it. I think they've made a plausible case. But when it comes to what provisional measures are you going to impose on Israel, whether a ceasefire will pass muster, my guess is no. Uh, turning now to the Israeli case, I try to be, believe me, I struggle hard to be my own devil's advocate, to look at it, give it a fair hearing, and decide. I would say, when I first heard it, I thought they made some case. But on the second reading and the third reading, my conclusion is, and I don't think it's a biased conclusion, they made no case for a very simple reason. Every assertion they made is based on evidence from their own side. They were unable to unable to adduce any evidence to refute those 101 UN agencies. So the UN agency says we're on the verge of mass famine in Gaza. And Israel says, well, actually, the humanitarian situation, it's still very poor, but things are improving. Where is your evidence? Well, they can't cite any evidence because no UN agency is saying that. And so on the crucial question of evidence to support their claims, it's there was one reference to the World Food Program, one reference to UNICEF, one in each, but without with those exceptions, every single piece of evidence are Hamas fighters hiding in hospitals? Are there tunnels under the hospitals? So on, so on, so on, so on. There's no evidence they can cite except what the Israeli government claims. And I think on those grounds alone, the case collapses. Uh, and then we can go into the claims they make that genocide is not occurring there. I can go through it. Uh, but my first, my overall impression is the South African case holds up on the question of a plausible claim of genocide, but they are going to run into trouble on the question of what provisional measures the ICJ can impose on Israel. Can I ask, um, just to that interesting point about where the limits of Israel's self-defense begins and ends, I mean, this is such a crucial question, and I just uh, was looking at some legal analysis from the uh, legal website Jurist, and this is what they have to say. They say that under international law, uh, the West Bank and the Gaza Strip have been duly recognized as militarily occupied territory since 1967. Israel, as the occupant, has the right to protect itself and its citizens from attacks by Palestinians within these territories. However, Israel also has a responsibility to maintain law and order, ensuring the security and well-being of the occupied population, as outlined in Regulation 43 of the Regulations Concerning the Laws and Customs of War on Land. Uh, that being said, it does seem to be the, the case that there's a real legitimate question here about whether or not the wildly disproportionate slaughter of Israeli, uh, sorry, of uh, Palestinian civilians in particular has gotten us to a point where, where, where there might have been some ambiguity or an argument to be made by Israel in the days or even a couple of weeks uh, following October 7th. Is it really the case that we think there is a reasonable argument that what Israel is doing is self-defense if we're at 24,000 plus um, dead Gazans, not to mention the m many statements uh, outlining the plan for collective punishment, ethnic cleansing, and the like that are detailed uh, in so much detail in the South African oh, submission. Oh. 
totally agree. I want, I'll just answer that briefly, and then I want to hear Moeen's opinion. Um, the problem there is the ICJ always has the option of saying, we admonish Israel when exercising its right of self-defense to obey the laws of war, IHL, International Humanitarian Law. But it would be very hard for them to say, because you have engaged in indiscriminate attacks, targeted attacks on civilians and civilian uh, uh, objects, um, disproportionate attacks, therefore we deprive you of any right to self-defense. What they can say is we deprive you of the right or we are admonishing you that in, your, in the exercise of your legitimate right to self-defense, which we recognize, we're admonishing you that you have to obey international humanitarian law. That's how I see it, but let's hear from Moeen. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I think it's important to understand um, that this case is solely and exclusively about genocide. In other words, the International Court of Justice is not going to judge whether Israel is um, obeying the laws of war. If the judges um, believe that Israel is committing war crimes and crimes against humanity, um, they will make very clear that that is none of their business and they won't offer an opinion of it because South Africa bought its case under the 1948 Genocide Convention and anything that is outside that convention, including war crimes and crimes against humanity and indiscriminate bombing and all the rest of it, falls outside um, uh, the boundaries of this case. Um, that would be my first observation. So what South Africa now um, needs to do is not demonstrate that Israel is in fact perpetrating genocide, but make a persuasive argument that there is a plausible case to be judged by the International Court of Justice. In that, I think they will succeed. As far as provisional measures are concerned, I think um, the judges are most likely not going to even consider South Africa's main demand of a ceasefire. And this will have less to do, I think, with the issues um, Norm raised than more to do with um, uh, precedent. I looked at, there are three previous genocide cases that appeared before the International Court of Justice. Uh, Bosnia in 1993, Myanmar in 2019, and Ukraine in 2022. In the Bosnia and Myanmar cases, uh, the International Court of Justice um, did, did not order a ceasefire or cessation of hostilities. All it did is call upon the accused party to strictly observe the provisions of the Genocide Convention and not to violate any of them. The only time it called for a ceasefire was in the case of Ukraine, but that was a very different case. Ukraine was not accusing Russia of genocide. Ukraine made the argument that Russia um, utilized accusations of genocide against Ukraine as the justification for its invasion of Ukraine, and that therefore um, uh, the ICJ should declare that Russia needs to cease military operations on Ukrainian territory. So it's a very, um, it doesn't, it's not a good analogy with what we're seeing now. And secondly, I think um, the question of a ceasefire is only of limited relevance uh, because the ICJ does not have any enforcement powers. The only um, method through which its rulings can be enforced is by the UN Security Council. And as we know, the U.S. is a permanent member of the Security Council and will veto anything that adversely affects um, Israel. And so I think we need to look at this um, not only in legal, but also in moral and political terms. And I think the mere fact that this case was presented to the International Court of Justice 
the mere fact that the ICJ um, uh, accepted uh, to hear this case and the extremely high likelihood that the ICJ will move forward with this case. In other words, it will determine that South Africa presented a plausible case for further uh, investigation. And, you know, there is always a likelihood um, that it will call for a ceasefire, although I consider that extremely unlikely for both the reasons uh, Norm mentioned and the ones I referred to. I think these together will taint Israel until the end of its days. I think the charge of genocide is going to stick to Israel eternally, irrespective of how the ICJ ends up ruling in the end several years down the line. And given that Israel um, presents itself as a state that was founded in response to the Nazi Holocaust, and given that Israel has uh, justified many of its most depraved policies as in effect necessary to prevent a second Holocaust. And now Israel stands formally accused before the world's highest court of perpetrating genocide. I think for that sector of global public opinion, and here I'm referring mainly to Western uh, public opinion, um, that has always given Israel a pass on so many issues. Um, because of the history of, of, of persecution of um, uh, European Jewry and, and the Nazi Holocaust. I think this case, simply by existing, will fundamentally and irrevocably alter uh, perceptions of Israel in the public sphere. And that is what I think is the main value um, uh, of this case, without you know detracting from the substantive and legal issues um, uh, that uh, Norman has raised. Um, I would like, yeah, I would like to comment briefly on that, and then I'm, obviously I'd like to hear from the two hosts of the program. I think the point Moeen made is very germane to what seems like an unrelated issue, but I think it's very related. Namely, the strange evolution in the mainstream coverage of the Israel-Palestine conflict, in this case, Gaza, in particular, the Times, which has an old timer. New York is, Times. New York Times, which has an old timer, is still the newspaper of record in my mind's eye. At the beginning, the Times was typically the Times making all these apologies to the state of Israel. And Norm, if I can just interrupt you, um, I, I'd just like to recall that on October 8th, the Times published an editorial um, entitled A Time for Unity and Resolve, basically calling um, uh, for the promotion of Israel's uh, war aims and for them to be achieved. I forgot that, to be honest. You blotted yeah. it out, a repressed memory. In any event, um, but as, the, as Israel's uh, uh, barbarism became impossible to ignore, the Times coverage was actually quite good. You could judge it not just by the content of the articles, but the pictures that were illustrating the articles. They were heart-wrenching. I will tell you, I have not watched one minute of any video footage on Gaza or even on October 7th. I, I won't watch it. I just... Um, kind of like Professor Chomsky, he only refers to a written record. Even if there is a movie on his life, he'll only refer to the written transcript. He will never re refer to the actual film. And I'm sort of the same way. I didn't watch anything. But the coverage was surprisingly good. But then it again abruptly changed and got awful. And it got awful when the issue of genocide came up. And I think it's the reason that Muin just suggested. Israel is, after all, the state of the Jewish people. That's its official title. And if the genocide charge sticks for the editors of the Times, it's not just the state of Israel whose name has been tainted 
as Moin put it, till the end of time, but it's the Jews who are tainted with the charge of genocide. Because old timers, you know, who run the times, the editors, they still see this Israel as being their, T-H-E-I-R, their state. And the idea of this eternal scarlet letter, the Jewish state has been tainted with the scarlet letter of genocide. They cannot abide that. That's a bridge too far. And so now the paper has become just, again, a propaganda organ for Israel. So one day they resurrect. I'm not saying if it's true or false. I'm simply saying for the hundredth time, they resurrect the rapes issue. I mean, it was already on October 8th, October 9th. It was already an issue. But then they suddenly resurrected it with apparently a very shoddy article. Then they raised this issue of the 430 miles of tunnels in Gaza. Wasn't it 4,300? No, no. <laughs> yeah. Which is, as far as I could tell, a physical impossibility. I can't claim to be an expert, and I'm trying to con uh, consult civil engineers on the issue, but that would mean every 1,200 feet along the width of Gaza, every 1,200 feet, there's a 25-mile tunnel stretching the whole length of Gaza. Uh, that's not plausible to me. In any event, so then they start to run with that. Then they had an article the other day saying that people are now walking freely in northern Gaza, whereas the humanitarian organizations were saying there were pockets of famine in northern Gaza. And I think the reason is because, you know, on the ICJ, they still read the Times. Don't kid yourself. The Times is still the newspaper of record for the judges on the uh, court. And so they're doing everything they can to get a not guilty verdict because for those old timers on the New York Times editorial board, that's crossing a red line. Our state, our state, the state of the Jewish people to be accused of genocide. You remind me of um, what the um, newly minted French foreign minister said about this case. He said, to accuse the Jewish state of genocide, that crosses a moral threshold. Mm. Right. You can't call a Jewish state genocidal. He didn't say whether it was factually true or right. not. It was a moral imperative. Mm. If it's a Jewish state, you can't call it genocidal. He didn't look at the evidence. He didn't care. There is and that's precisely how they've been able to get away with it, because people find the allegation offensive more offensive than the actual genocide happening because yeah. it speaks to a total hypocrisy well you know blinken uh, worked himself into a frenzy dismissing it as meritless um and then the germans worked themselves into an even uh, greater frenzy um effectively saying you know we're recognized global leaders in genocide trust us uh, right. when we give our opinion on this um this is uh, this case is an outrage. Yeah, the the hypocrisy of uh, Israel charging uh, South Africa with kind of being disqualified from weighing in because they experienced apartheid or something. Um, mm -hmm. You know, how dare you point out uh, apartheid if you have experienced apartheid firsthand? Right. But then turning around judge. and saying, "Oh yes, but believe Germany because they're." The experts in genocide was really quite rich. I mean, Katie, I wonder what you make of some of this. You've done so much good media criticism at Useful Idiots and on your show. And, and I wonder if you have a similar read as to Norm about the uh, kind of trajectory of New York Times coverage or whether you have anything to add to that. Because I do suspect that some people listening might bristle a little bit at the idea that there was ever a time when the New York Times coverage could be described as good, even though I take Norm's point that the gravity of what is happening in Gaza is so extreme that even 
bad or skewed or biased coverage that includes basic photographic evidence and a basic accounting of lives lost, even if you say Hamas death toll numbers and all of that, is still a compelling case for humanitarian intervention in Gaza. Yeah, I think that one of the most creative things that the New York Times and, and a lot of legacy print media does is that they make it a mystery who does the killing. So there's a lot of use of passive voice. There's a lot of description of deaths, people killed, people lost. Um, I think that's one of the ways that at the New York Times and other similar outlets that their bias towards Israel is is shown consistently, kind of regardless of whether or not they do, as Norm pointed out, I mean, there are times when I think just by virtue of reporting, uh, the evidence is so overwhelmingly it's there's so much violence, death and destruction that it's hard without lying to sugarcoat it. But they are creative in the way that they whitewash it. And in and, and the other direction, I think, as Norm referred to, and when we've sp spoken about this briefly, and I know you've done shows on this, Brie, but the coverage of the rape allegations has been fairly abysmal. And um, it's, a, it's just kind of a game of telephone where uh, claims are made claims are referred to and no one actually looks at where the claims are from and then they were made in the new york times so now everyone else can cite them because it's from the new york times and the new york times is so reputable right and and if i could just give um one incident um i think it was about a week ago before the icj case suddenly you had the story in the new york times citing unnamed Amer uh, senior american intelligence officials um, confirming Israeli ag allegations that there was a command center and, and tunnel network and all the rest of it below Al Shifa Hospital in Gaza City, the main hospital in the Gaza Strip. I don't need to repeat what the allegations were and what happened, but I found it quite telling. The story had been dead for weeks in the mainstream media. Um, then a few days prior to the Times article, there was a very lengthy and detailed article in the Washington Post that basically dismissed all the Israeli claims. And then suddenly you had um, the New York Times article. Um, and whereas when the issue um, was very current, you had U.S. Um, diplomats and political leaders making all kinds of allegations and sourcing them to U.S. intelligence. You never actually had a U.S. intelligence source speaking directly to journalists. Now, all of a sudden, they were being anonymously quoted. And I think it's exactly what Norm said. You know, Israel needed to be provided with a few slam dunks on the eve of um, the ICJ J case. And given how much, um, how uh, the Israelis repeatedly referred to human shields and, and every civilian installation being a Hamas base or a weapons depot and so on, I would look at it in that context. And there's definitely been on vid on television. I mean, I've been we've been focusing on that a bunch on useful idiots. But one example that sticks out is there was a three or four year old baby killed and the anchor referred to her as a young woman. <laughs> She's right. Palestinian, of course. Right. Yeah. I mean, say, similarly. Sorry. I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. To your point, uh, uh, there was just before the ICJ uh, presentation, uh, Netanyahu came out with a statement saying, well, of course, we don't have any intention to do any ethnic cleansing. Of course, there's no permanent resettlement plans. They seemed to be immediately anticipating that that was central to the claims that were made in the South African briefing, uh, put out just literally a day or two before the ICJ. And then you you saw in the Israeli case before the ICJ, the making reference to those statements that had very clearly been laid as foundation as proof that Netanyahu didn't actually have any intention of engaging in any of the clearly documented uh, statements from any number of people in government that were pointing to the plan to ethnically cleanse, push push Gazans permanently out, permanently destroy every building, permanently resettle the population. Well, part of the tie was just positively amusing because their delegation at the ICJ, the Israeli delegation, they leaned not insignificantly, I won't say it was the whole of their argument, but it leaned not insignificantly 
their presentation was, I think, January 12th. It leaned on the statement made by Netanyahu on January 10th. <laughs> As if yes. the, the, right. they said, can you exactly. just make a statement that we can quote? Right, exactly. In our, no. in our reply, in our, yeah, it was, yeah. It was so, so thin. Like, it was so, so thin. At some point, well, let's continue because uh, there are some issues I'd like to get to, but maybe we'll get to in the course of the conversation. So let's hear from you. Well, I, I know that you, Norm, had wanted to discuss um, two figures in the in the hearing. Um, one is Malcolm Shaw, the lawyer who had a fairly viral moment, uh, the British lawyer who represented Israel. Another one is Aharon Barak. We have uh, very short clips of each of them. Shall we show them and then discuss them? Well, let, let's start with Malcolm Shaw. Okay. So let's take a look at Malcolm Shaw, who had this viral moment uh, in, in which he, he became a bit of a detective. The court was prepared to consider not only the question, question of the plausibility of rights, Some has shuffled my papers. Well, but also the uh, question of the possible breach of such rights. Quite a moment. I'm not a um, I'm not a believer. My parents were resolute atheists, and it would be a betrayal of their memory were I to become a believer. But at that particular moment, I did think there was some divine intervention um, to rattle Mr. Shaw. Um, I find him a particularly revolting character. He has the moral stature of something across between a used car salesman and a personal injury lawyer. He has a very impressive academic record. Actually, I discovered I had sitting on my uh, bookshelf, a I think it's an 800 page textbook of his of international law. But I did go back, read some of his uh, submissions because he's Israel's basically Israel's official lawyer. Um, in this particular case, in his first statement, he had to deal with two issues. Number one, is this a dispute between Israel and South Africa? Is there a dispute? And he used all these technical arguments to prove it doesn't qualify as a dispute. Now, I recognize in law, I have to defer to Brianna Joy Gray, there are all these technicalities which to some extent, um, to some extent fly in the face of what common sense tells you. But there has to be some connection. Whatever legal technicality there is, there has to be some connection with a word as everybody understands its meaning. Now, the ICJ rules, I think it's Article 9, says we entertain disputes, and there are two basic criteria for disputes. One is a personal exchange between the two parties. Another is what they call an ex a uh, expression in what are called multilateral forums, like the United Nations and all sorts of other places. Now, South Africa says Israel is committing genocide. Israel says it's not committing genocide. I think any reasonable person has to conclude there is a dispute here. Especially when Israel is denouncing South Africa as Hamas is the legal right. arm of Hamas. Well, they also said, Israel said, 
that South Africa is complicitous in genocide because one of the um, one of the um, grounds for indictment of a genocide is if you are complicit, you know, right. complicit in genocide. So they said because South Africa hosts Hamas, South Africa has good diplomatic relations with Hamas. They say South Africa is a party to genocide. Now. How in God's name can there possibly be any doubt that a dispute exists? So along comes Malcolm Shaw, and he says things like this. South Africa never told us that they disagree with us about genocide. So they said, uh, Malcolm Shaw, he says very cleverly, or he thinks cleverly, he says, there's not a dispute, there is a unispute. There's not a dispute, there's a unispute. Okay, I would say too clever by half. Then he says, South Africa forgets it takes two to tango. No, it didn't forget that it takes two to tango. One side says there's a genocide going on. Israel is committing it. The other side says there's no genocide going on. We're not committing anything. So how in the face of common sense you can come before the court and say, do you know what he, Malcolm Shaw says? He says, South Africa didn't give us a chance to sit down and negotiate, and maybe we could have come to an agreement on this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like we're talking about alimony. It was mass murder, we've agreed, but not genocide. <laughs> not halfway. You know, yeah, but, go sorry, go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt. No, no, the the write-up in, um, in The Intercept makes the point that, it, it summarizes it the way you did, and then makes the point that after uh, South Africa publicly accused Israel of genocide in November and called for the ICC to issue a warrant for Netanyahu's arrest, Israel responded by withdrawing its ambassador to South Africa, which, which somewhat undermines the idea that it was willing to engage in any kind of diplomacy or negotiation around that what exactly is going on in Gaza. <laughs> but according to Shaw, it's just a minor squabble or misunderstanding and if we had gotten together for a latte, it probably could have been ironed for out. Lot, for latkes. Right. And then he says, ah, uh, but now we'll never know. No, I think we know. We know there wasn't going to be a squaring of the circle on this particular issue. And then the second point that he had to deal with was the question, which is the core issue. Uh, is, there, is there an intent to commit genocide. And the Israeli delegation handed over to him that second issue. So the big jurisdictional issue was Malcolm Shaw, and then the big uh, substantive issue of genocide. And basically what Shaw argues is this. He says, Israel's only aim is to get the hostages back and to dismantle Hamas. He then says, step two, all those statements that we all now know by Netanyahu and Amalek, by the defense minister and no uh, food, water, electricity, and fuel, all those statements, he dismisses them as, quote, a few random statements. And he says, what we have to look at is the operational orders by the Ministry of Security Affairs and by the War Cabinet. You have to look at the orders. And all the orders are very proper. You have to obey international humanitarian law. You have to be proportionate. You can't target civilians. All the orders are very proper. And then the next step in his argument is to say, that's exactly what Israel's been doing. It's been absolutely 
faithful to the principles of proportionality, what's called distinction and discrimination. Uh, and then he says that they've also been very cooperative on the issue of bringing in humanitarian relief. Where, whereas what's the South African argument? South African argument is, let's look at those few random statements. They're genocidal. Let's look at the actual practice on the ground. And then come the hundreds of citations that Israel is not being proportionate, it's not being discriminate, it's not um, uh, proportionate, and it's targeting civilians. And they say that what's actually happening on the ground coheres with the statements, those few random statements, they're committing genocide. And then the last part is to say the humanitarian relief is trivial next to what needs to be done. And so in my opinion, the Israeli case completely falls apart when you look at what's actually happening. When you look at what's actually happening, they're not targeting Hamas. That's not true. Now, you might say I'm exaggerating here when I say they're not targeting Hamas. In fact, they're not. It's just hit or miss. When you are bombing indiscriminately, when you are carpet bombing, you're hoping one of your bombs will draw, drop on a tunnel. But you're not actually targeting the tunnel. That's what it means to bomb indiscriminately. You're not targeting anything. So I, I will, of course, acknowledge they want to dismantle Hamas or defeat it or destroy it. I have no doubt about that. But their modus operandi, how they're going about doing it, is by simply indiscriminately bombing everything, flattening everything. And then in the northern sector, after you've flattened everything, almost literally, there are many towns which are gone, like Beit Lahia, Beit Hanun, apparently there's nothing there anymore. And then they come in for the ground operation when they allegedly are looking for the tunnels. But that's not the, what they're doing. That's why from the beginning, Israel won the propaganda war from day one when it was described as Israel-Hamas war. Right. That, was, that was the terminology that was immediately adopted by everyone. That's not true. It's an Israel-Gaza war they are targeting the civilian population. And as a afterthought, if we happen to get Hamas, you know, this carpet bombing, terrific. But that's not what was happening. Hamas. John Finer, uh, uh, just really quickly, then Moin, take it away. But John Finer, National Security Advisor John Finer, during one of his appearances on the Sunday morning shows this weekend, said something about <laughs> how Israel is beginning the shift to targeting more high value Hamas targets, which, as Aaron pointed out, was kind of a confession that up until now they haven't been targeting them. They're just starting to. It's just yeah. been the wholesale mass slaughter up until now. Yeah, yeah I think, in fact, um, uh, in my view, that was the strongest part of um, the South African presentation because genocide is primarily or crucially about intent. Um, in, in, in theory, you, you know, Israel can kill as, as, as many people as it wants, but unless it can be demonstrated that there was genocidal intent to those actions, it can't be guilty of genocide. And for the um, South African legal team, first, um, uh, Abed al-Hassim, I thought, made a very powerful uh, presentation showing the genocidal nature of Israel's campaign. And then uh, Tembeka, uh, Tembeka Nguka, Nguka Itob did, I thought, the crucial presentation on intent where he just overwhelmed us with statement after statement after statement from Israeli leaders, uh, from decision makers, 
prominent members of civil society, journalists, all the rest of it, and even more importantly, then drew a very persuasive link of how these statements were translated into action on the ground uh, by, by the foot soldiers, uh, so to speak. By the way, um, uh, do you guys want to hear, this is a little behind the scenes, but uh, someone who's been on my show and uh, Bree's show, and in fact, I should do another show with all of us together, but it's Craig McIver, the UN um, human rights lawyer who resigned from the UN. And he has, uh, he texted me a message. Can I, can I share it? It's about, it's about a, a point of departure that he has. Let's see. He, and I got permission. I just thought make it's an interesting response. Okay. So he says, excellent show with Bree Norman Moeen, but I disagree somewhat with their analysis of the self-defense question. This is not Ukraine, Russia, or internal assaults within a state, Myanmar. This is occupied territory, and the ICJ has already ruled in the wall case that Israel, as the occupying power, does not have an Art 51 right to self-defense in the territories it occupies. In other words, they can defend themselves in generic terms, but they have no right to make war on Gaza in the name of self-defense. Second, the kinds of acts it is carrying out in Gaza are unlawful, even where self-defense is recognized. Third, if there is a plausible case of genocide, self-defense is no excuse. Finally, a ceasefire would not render Israel defenseless, as they could still repel any attacks. I don't know what the court will rule. Bias is a factor, and they might fall for Israel's arguments. But the self-defense claim of Israel is not as clear as Norm and Muin have suggested tonight. But great discussion. I love both of them, and you and Brie, too. Well, he's, he's of course, entirely correct on, on Article 51. And that's already um, been ruled on, as he points out, in 2004 by the ICJ in its advisory opinion of the wall, where it basically said... Um, the right of self-defense under Article 51 only exists in relation to other states um, and not to a territory it occupies. But I, I do think um, that while he's legally correct, I do think, first of all, um, that the judges or a majority of them are probably going to look at it um, more from the vantage point that Norm has described um, rather than um, from, you know, the, the, the technically legal correct points uh, that, that, that he makes. And even more importantly, I suspect they're not even going to get into this issue because if we look at the two other cases, okay, it was a different court and it was in a different period, but I think they will just stick strictly um, to the need to uphold uh, the genocide convention and probably on the pretext our business is the genocide convention and we're not going to get into the nitty-gritty of this ongoing um uh armed conflict if i could just make one more point um another responsibility that israel as an occupying power has israel has many more responsibilities towards the palestinian population of gaza um than a party to an armed conflict would normally have towards um uh the civilian population in enemy territory in a foreign state because the Gaza Strip is um, an occupied territory. And so therefore Israel actually has a positive obligation to ensure the provision of humanitarian supplies to the population of the Gaza Strip. So it has even less of an excuse um, uh, to prohibit uh, the entry of, of, of food, of water, of fuel, uh, of, of medical supplies and so on um, than it would have in an interstate conflict. I just want to make sure I that I'm... Want to go ahead. Oh, go ahead I'm sorry. I just want no, to make sure okay. I understood Mouin's argument mm -hmm. um, because it sounds to me earlier when I kind of brought up what um, uh, Mokhyber just brought up there in the beginning, pushing back against you a little bit, Norm, uh, I I, I I don't quite understand. You, you made the argument that the specifics about um, what kind of constitutes genocide on the ground are details they're not going to get into, and that's kind of separate and, par and apart from this other broader question. And made this argument that they would that are, they would resolve this at a higher level without getting into the broader 
conflict. But it does seem to be these questions that might not be literally about genocide, but these sub questions about humanitarian, uh, 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 cross, crossing humanitarian lines, whether it's collective punishment or the like, go to the question of whether it's genocide and there's genocidal intent, especially if you have an obligation to a subpopulation, for example. Totally I'm you're sorry? Totally, you're totally correct. You're, you're totally correct. There, there are yeah, two so, ways, yeah. There's two ways to look at the question. One way is to look at genocidal statements by the senior officials in the government. But as the South African, two South African representatives said in the proceedings, very rarely do governments announce we're committing a genocide. What was very unusual about the current case, the one brought by South Africa, is you actually could find genocidal statements by senior officials. And it wasn't and, just a leaked memo. Right, right. Yeah, it it out loud so, publicly. But, in general, in general, the way you you um, you prove intent is by the natural, inevitable, inexorable consequences of the actions you're taking on the ground. Mm -hmm. So, if the defense minister says we're going to prohibit any food, water, electricity, or fuel to enter Gaza. He doesn't have to say because he want to kill off the whole population. He doesn't have to state his intent. The natural, inevitable, inexorable consequence of denying a civilian population of any food, fuel, electricity, uh, or water for a protracted period of time is genocide. So the South Africa presentation had two parts. One part was to say, we can prove intent on the basis of all these statements, which as Maureen pointed out, one after another, after another, after another. But they also said, apart from the statements, we can yes. infer genocide from the actions on the ground, which is usually how it's done. If you look at the Myanmar case, they looked at the actions of the government and said, based on these actions, there's a you know a plausible case for genocide. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't agree. Uh, let, let's just be clear about. Don't want to get into technicalities because they're actually not even that important. Article 51 is part of the UN Charter, and the UN Charter says that when a when a country, a state is the object of attack, or it's normally interpreted also as if an attack is inevitable, irreversible, and you come, you get wind of it, let's say two minutes ahead of time, you get wind imminent. of this attack, imminent, uh, then you have the right of self-defense. But under international law, you don't only have the right of self-defense if you're attacked by another state. If mm -hmm. that were the case, the United States wouldn't have had a right of self-defense against 9-11. We weren't attacked by a state on 9-11. But it, nobody would argue that if a non-state actor commits a violent uh, breach of your sovereignty, that a state doesn't have the right to self-defense. Of course it does under international law. The question, so there I disagree with um, Mr. Mokhyber. Uh, they clearly, in my opinion, I've looked at the law, I've studied it. Uh, they clearly have a right to self-defense. Where things get very cloudy, in my opinion, are, number one, do you have the right of self-defense against an illegal occupation? Well, that's his point, right? That's that's Mokhyber's entire point. That not that anything that you said before is incorrect, but that this isn't 9-11, which some people will quibble with as well, but that this is a circumstance where we have an occupied territory within Israel, however you want to characterize it, that has its own right to self-defense, including violently to liberate itself. And, and so therefore those are directly intention. And I, I don't I don't know that I understand what the argument is around 
Israel having an extremely limited claim to any kind of self-defense because it is the ostensible aggressor in its relationship with Palestine. Well, I, 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 go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. No, no I was just going to say I very much hope the court surprises us, um, but I'd be very surprised if 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 they um, address the issue of a ceasefire at all. And not for these technical legal reasons, but I think primarily for political ones, and that they'll take a very narrow interpretation of of their um, responsibilities when issuing provisional measures. But well, I, I, I very much hope I'm is, proven wrong. I want to ask you about that as well, because my understanding was the whole point of the genocide convention and how this this is why. Um, uh, I'm sorry, I'm blocking his name now. The journalist who's been advocating for this for a long time. Um, Sam Husseini? With, with Sam, Sam Husseini, exactly. I'm sorry. Um, that's exactly why Sam was pushing for this specifically. Because unlike other, one, unlike other treaties and other kind of international obligations, Israel and the United States are, are kind of selectively not a part of some of them that would cause them to have some accountability. They were both, they are both, everybody is signatories to this genocide convention. And the two, the genocide convention um, creates an obligation for all other signatories to enforce it and to do what they can to stop genocide, which and is why there's them. an interesting yeah. argument for right. um, Yemenis doing what they can in the Red Sea to Heroes. create a blockade. Right. So even if there is even the most tepid of claims that stop short of saying you must have a ceasefire, it does seem to me that as finding that Israel is... Um, uh, engaging in a genocide here creates uh, as a matter of like definition under the genocide convention, an obligation of various states to intervene and provide some cover for actors like the Yemenis in the Red Sea to, to say, in, in fact, you know, as I think it's already the case, but to say, in fact, that it's you, the United States who are instigating an illegal violent action against us. We're the ones who are fulfilling our obligations under this international treaty to do what we can to nonviolently intercede on behalf of a population that's undergoing a genocide. Again, I don't want to get bogged down in the fine points, but I think the argument you just made misses a critical fine point. This, the ICJ is not passing judgment on whether Israel is committing genocide. They're only passing judgment on whether a plausible case has been made by South Africa. Right, It'll but that's be, the first step, right? Will, right, but you can't say other states have an obligation to uh, uh, prevent genocide if the genocide has not been established. That won't be right. for years before. Right, but no, I, I, I understand that. But this is the first step in a process that we're getting to. So whether or not it's now or four years from now, knowing that we're building to a world where that is an eventuality or a possible outcome, isn't that what we're talking about? It doesn't have to be tomorrow. Well, right, but I'll speak strictly for myself now. I focused on the substance. I didn't realize that even if they establish a plausible case has been made, it still doesn't mean any action will be taken. And certainly the other states to the, geno uh, the, uh, the genocide convention aren't any under any obligation to do anything because there's a huge chasm that separates plausible case from verdict. Um, so I didn't realize that, as Maureen knows, because we talk on a very regular basis, I was uh, surprised and then I started to pay close attention to what uh, provisional measures were actually made. Now, you can say there's a plausible case and no provisional measures. That can happen. Or the provisional measures can be very superficial, uh, very anodine. So that's, it's separate things. What I would say, and here we'll maybe switch the topic a little. Um, I think I totally support the Houthis. Uh, because, you know, and here it's going to be a personal reaction. And there are several aspects to it. Number one, you'll be a surprise perhaps to learn, as I learned, during that horrible South, uh, Saudi Arabian blockade of Gaza, excuse me, blockade of Yemen, 
between 2015 and 2018, in three years, in three years, do you know how many Houthis, how many Yemenis died? You'll be very surprised, I think. I think something I, like 300,000. I lot. saw, no, just those three years, mm -hmm. 88,000 mm -hmm. of whom 60% starved to death. You hear me? 60% of those 88,000 Yemenis, because of that brutal blockade, starved to death. And for me, the Houthis, sure, there's a religious side to it. I'm not going to deny it. But there is just a fundamental understanding, a human sympathy, a pity for what's being done to the people of Gaza because it was done to them. Now, some people say they're not targeting directly only Israeli vessels or Israeli bound vessels. I really don't give a damn. I know I can be a stickler for international law, but my view is during the war in Vietnam, I know how much I'm dating myself. During the war in Vietnam, we had a slogan, one of our slogans. It was no business as usual. That when millions, as it turned out, millions of Vietnamese are being killed by our government, we have no right to carry on with business as usual. And the Houthis are sending the same message to the world. You want to continue your trade? You want to continue your business? You want to build your economies while the people of Gaza are facing mass famine? No. Now, you know, even Russia and China abstained in that UN vote attacking the Houthis because they too care about business. They too care about their economy. And the Houthis say their message to the world is while the people of Gaza are being martyred, there is going to be no business as usual. We will target anyone or everyone who passes through those waters until the people of Gaza are freed from this genocide. I here, ready? As a Jew, I get that. As a Jew, I would have respected any government in the world during the Nazi Holocaust, any people in the world during the Nazi Holocaust who are do who would have done what the Houthis are doing. They say it in very simple, plain, uneducated, unrefined language. You will not destroy the people of Gaza. I deeply resonate to that. You know, I'm going to just tell you one last thing and then you can react because I know you're going to lose your license or something for, for me saying it, but that's my problem. I take complete responsibility for it. Um, I don't know how many of you have read Rousseau's second discourse on inequality. It happens to be very good. And one of the things he says in the second discourse is, men would be monsters. Men would be monsters were it not for the natural feeling of pity. pity. It's pity that humanizes people. And then he takes the next step and says, the more educated you become, the more you develop that rational faculty, which enables you to find excuses why not to do anything when others are suffering. And he says, the, if a person is being murdered outside a philosopher's window, he says, the philosopher puts his hands to his ears and says to himself, perish if you will, I am safe. That's what education does to you. It enables you to suppress and rationalize 
your natural sense of pity, not to act out of it. And then he has a great line. He says, whenever there's a conflict in the street, you know, two kids beating the daylights out of each other or two gangs beating the daylights out of each other, he says, quote, the prudent man, the educated man, he walks away. He says, it's always the market woman, or as we would now say, the fish market woman, who intervenes to break it up. She's reacting to her pity. And that's the whole world. The whole world finds all sorts of excuses to walk away. The or deliver high explosives. Right. <laughs> Even worse, yeah. The they'd be they'd be considered righteous Gentiles, right? In, in the context of Holocaust education. I totally agree. The Houthis are so primitive and they carry their spears and they're so backward. Daggers. What? Daggers. Daggers. But you know what? They have pity for the people of Gaza because they went through the same thing. And that's why I say, don't mess with the Houthis. And it's, it's actually a, a very ancient and sophisticated uh, uh, civilization that goes back a very, very long time um, and, and has very much to commend itself. Well, you know, Biden famously recently said about the Houthis, he was asked about Al Ansar Allah, uh, he was asked if the strikes uh, were working. He said, uh, let's see, um, where's this quote? I think he said, no, uh, but we'll keep bombing. Yeah, he said, well, if you mean working, are they, by working, are they going to stop the Houthis? No, but are we going to keep doing it? Yes. And, you know. Um, Just psych. I mean, I can't believe the stuff he says out loud, which people, is true to his yeah. credit, but. And some people have been suggesting um, that it's a whole new ball game now yeah. that Yemen is being bombed by the Americans and the British. But let's not forget um, the Saudis were bombing Yemen with um, some of the most advanced American weaponry. Um, you know, they had highly trained pilots, uh, they had um, uh, targeting intelligence from the U.S. intelligence uh, services, and they had boots on the ground. So the idea them. that the Americans are going to succeed where the right. Saudis failed because the Americans are American um, is, right. is, I think, a pipe dream. They also, um, you know, it was a great rebranding exercise that Biden did. He did this. He 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 presented himself as such a departure from Trump on several yes. things, including on the Yemen war, the Saudi prominent. war in Yemen, yeah. right? And then all he does is say, "Is okay, we're not going to support their um, uh, defensive. We're only going to support their defensive military moves, yeah. not their offensive ones." As if Saudi Arabia is defending itself from Yemen. The worst years, incidentally, were during Obama, and and. Um, What's her name? Samantha right? Powers. Oh, Samantha Powers, yeah. But nothing. Nothing. There is a problem from hell. Yeah. Well, um, I have to ask you this, Norm, because I'm sure people raise this with you. Um, the the fact that the, I guess the Ansar Lala, they part of their their charter or some official document of theirs says curse the Jews. It's it's their slogan, I their think. Slogan. Um, death, death to America, death, death to, to Israel. Israel. No, curse the Jews. Yeah. Now I, I don't I get, know what I say to that, but I want I to hear it. Yeah, I don't get hot under the collar about those things, and not because I'm giving people a pass. Israel describes itself as the exactly. state of the Jewish people. Right. What do you expect these people? Exactly. To, have they ever met a Jew who was nice to them? I doubt it. I doubt it. So if they conflate the two, let Israel, you know, call itself by the name, it's all, it's, you know, call itself the state of the Nazi people, and that problem wouldn't be around, wouldn't arise. So right. then they would just say they hate Nazis, right. and then the First matter, the, the matter would uh, would disappear. So I don't get, you know, excited about those things. I, I've I've said this story before, so you'll forgive me. 
Um, my parents, as you know, they passed through the Nazi Holocaust. And in later years, they read a lot of the history. They wanted to know what happened to them, you know, what happened to their family. And I remember my father, my father knew Russian. He learned it late in life, but he knew Russian. And he was reading a Russian book on the Nazi Holocaust, okay? And he came over to me and he said, this is a good book. I like this book. So why do you like this book, Dad? He said to me, because they don't talk about the Germ. excuse me, they don't talk about the Nazis. They talk about the Germans. He hated that distinction. Because for him, you have to understand, for him, my mother, every German was a Nazi. That They didn't meet other Germans. It's not as if they went to Germany and they went and saw some uh, Wagner in the opera house. For it was them, also a Nazi. <laughs> right. Yeah. For them, they only knew Germans as Nazis. So I never tried to persuade my father. I remember I once asked my mother, I said, Mom, do you ever remember meeting? Because I was trying to make, you know, the humanistic argument. Right. I said, Mom, did you ever meet? Did you ever see a German who wasn't utterly vile? You know, horrible. I wouldn't use the word vile. Horrible. She said to me, one time, one time, I saw one German who seemed to have been not happy with what was going on. One, you get me? One. And so the Houthis, all they see of Jews is what Israel is doing yeah. to Gaza, Israel is doing to Lebanon, Israel is doing here, Israel is doing there. I can't get excited about that. It's not because I give a pass to anti-Semitism. It's because you have to look at the context. Of course. And I understood where my father's coming from. And I'm not going to hold somebody else to a more stringent standard than I held my own parents. Yeah, I totally uh, agree with what you're saying. Um, that Israel can't conflate Z Jewishness and Zionism and then get upset when people use those terms interchangeably, which is just another example of Israel making Israel and APAC and um, the ADL and every single other person who conflates being a Jew with being a Zionist. Those are the people making Jews unsafe. Some of the people, not the only ones. Um, Ms. Brianna, you're fallen silent. Unusual for you. Um, I don't know that I have a, a lot to contribute here, Norm. You're telling, I think, a, a, you and Katie are speaking to your perspective largely as Jews and how you interpret or how you respond to a, you know, the statement that apparently is part of a, a, a Houthi slogan or however you want to characterize it. And that makes sense to me. I could reason by analogy as a Black person and have similar feelings about you know, certain attitudes certain older members of my family have, for instance, toward white people or certain other groups. And that makes sense to me, but I don't know that it's really on me to say who, which Jewish people should or should not be offended by um, the Ansarala slogan here. I'm going to ask you a question, Brianna, because your name came up in my mind when I was reading something, and I want to hear your reaction. Uh, as you guys know, Brianna and I had a disagreement about the slogan from the river to the sea oh. power will be free so a few days ago uh syed nasrallah he, uh, the head of hezbollah he gave a major speech uh in lebanon uh, which i did email to muin did you have a chance to read it i did okay so I, you'll you'll confirm or deny what i'm saying and at one point Nasrallah raised the issue of from the river to the sea. And he said, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, basically. And then he said, all those Jews in Israel, he doesn't call it Israel, the Zionist entity, all those Jews have double passports. There are Israeli Brits, Israeli French. They all have double passports. He then said, Israel is not really a nation. Israeli Jews aren't really a nation. 
because whenever there's trouble, they run away. That's what he said. Real nations, they stay put and they fight. He says, the Israelis know they run away. And then he said, well, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. The land belongs to the indigenous population, the Palestinians, all the Jews should leave. And when I read that, is that accurate, Maureen? Um, I'm not entirely certain. I, I don't remember that specific passage, whether he was um, advocating that they should leave or whether he was advocating that those who don't like it should, should leave. I would say the first. Mm -hmm. Because his next statement was, it belongs to the indigenous population. Mm -hmm. So when I read that, I thought about you, Brianna, and I thought to myself, well, that's exactly the argument I was making, that it's a legitimate interpretation of from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, that a legitimate interpretation is that everybody who's not Jewish doesn't belong there and should leave. You mean everyone who's not Arab? Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's not their country, they're not really a nation, they should get up and leave. And would you accept that as a legitimate interpretation of that slogan? That's my first question, because that's how Nasrallah interpreted it. And secondly, do you think that's a legitimate demand? Can I just say quickly well, that, that people, just to, and then Bree, take it away. I just want to say, there are obviously still people who use that to phrase who don't mean that. So the fact that Nasrallah does it to mean that doesn't mean that other people don't mean something else. But Right. I would say, first of all, that the Likud party, whose charter in existence is older than Hamas, has in their foundational charter the phrase between the sea and Jordan, there will be only Israeli sovereignty. That is at no point in time ever interpreted to be a genocidal statement, even though I would argue that the behavior of the Likud party is certainly much more genocidal than anything that Hamas or any other Palestinian entity, Palestinian entity has ever put into effect. Um, you now you've put forward that apparently uh, the Hamas uh, leader has made oh. similar statements. Uh, sorry, the Hezbollah leader has made uh, similar statements. And we just heard uh, Netanyahu, although there's some dispute around the translation, translation, making the same or similar statements. I think substantively, even if there's a translation is a little different, it sounds just like the Likud party statement. So even if it's not the exact words, the point is everything left of the Jordan, uh, west of the Jordan River should be Israel, Israel uh, and not anything Palestinian. I don't believe you should stop saying words that you believe simply because someone else who's bad uses the same fra fra framing or same phrase. I think there were people who said, let's say, black power and black militancy, who were more militant and more open to the idea of killing white people than others who said black power and just basically meant you should have a good self-esteem and love your natural hair. And I don't think the flexibility and the expansiveness of the English language should put me in some defensive position where I'm not allowed to use words that are meaningful to me and that I am perfectly happy to clarify and explain if anybody wants to ask me a follow-up question. I don't think that I should be running away from my own phraseology simply because other people in the world want to mimic my words. If that's the standard, then you can easily see that any slogan adapted can be weaponized by any bad faith actor through the, sh the simple act of mimicry. Someone could say ceasefire now actually means that Hamas must stand down. And so therefore I'm going to protest in the street ceasefire now, but I am a Zionist entity and saying ceasefire now means Hamas needs to do a ceasefire now. And if, if Zionists wanted to organize like that and try to co-opt that language and write op-eds in the New York Times, they might be able to get some traction there. Does that mean I'm going to stop saying ceasefire now? I, I my, my fundamental argument with you, uh, Norm, is that this would be a more compelling case on your end if the, if the, if the ceasefire now side of things, if the um, uh, Israel is committing a genocide uh, view of things weren't 
an, an, an ascending point of view, that hearts and minds weren't being one in larger and larger numbers, if 66% of Americans and uh, almost 80% of Democrats weren't in line with the view that Israel is needs to do a ceasefire, that they're behaving disproportionately, and the sheer volume of human death in Gaza is unconscionable. But I just don't understand why I would be at all in taking a defensive posture and changing my language, or not mine literally, but the pro-Palestinian advocates' language, when they are winning this rhetorical battle for the first time in the history of this conflict, more people, especially in the younger age group, are more sympathetic to Palestinians than to Israelis. Let me hear Moeen. Well, I, I think I agree with Brianna. I mean, from the river to the sea means different things to different people. And just because um, you use a particular word or phrase or slogan, differently than I do um, doesn't make me responsible for the way that you use it. I mean, it's a bit like saying um, you can't call yourself a communist without taking responsibility for the Cambodian genocide. Mm. Um, so um, uh, that would be my, my first statement. Um, uh, you and I can have ascribed very different meanings to the same concept and that doesn't make either of them um uh illegitimate or rather um uh if if i me mean something in a certain way i can't be held responsible for the meaning you ascribe to that the second point i would make is um i'm not aware that this is i mean i'm assuming um, uh, what you're saying about uh, Nasrallah is correct, I'm not aware of this consistently being his position in recent years, whether he's referred to this point at all, and if he has, whether he's made it. And I would argue that it also reflects, um, in a sense, uh, genocide blowback. Um, not that Hezbollah was ever um, uh, a, a proponent of a negotiated peace with Israel. Um, but I think what you're seeing now is that there is a sector of society that was previously amenable to either peaceful coexistence with Israel as a state or peaceful coexistence with Israeli Jewish society um, that as a result of um, the genocidal campaign Israel has waged during the past uh, three months is no longer prepared to entertain um, uh, such uh, such notions. People um, have come to oppose the very principle of peaceful coexistence with a genocidal state, even if they still believe that theoretically peaceful coexistence with Israel um, could be possible. And again, um, uh, for many people, that means that the Israeli state must be dismantled and that Israeli Jewish society will have to accept living as equals um, uh, in that territory. And for other people, like uh, this statement, it means um, that those who uh, immigrated from elsewhere should return to their lands of origin. So there's, again, different ways of, of, of looking at the same issue. I would just add, I think there are two aspects, as I've said in private conversation with Muin and my other uh, young colleague and comrade, Jamie Stern Weiner. There are two aspects. Number one, as Muin says, after the commission in broad daylight of a genocide, it's hardened the other side for very understandable reasons about the prospect of living in peaceful coexistence. But I believe, as I've said to Moeen, and you can comment now, there's the other side. The other side is October 7th, transmitted the message far and wide that Israel is not invincible. It's vulnerable. 
and that it, there is a military option against it. We don't have to compromise with it. Lo and behold, this ragtag army succeeded in a way that they didn't even imagine. They didn't realize it was so easy to penetrate the perimeter of Israel. They were shocked. And so the willingness to enter into any kind of compromise has been significantly undermined by the prospect why do we need to compromise with it? Victory is within reach. That, that's no, certainly no true as well. Well, I, I wanted to. Oh, sorry, Moin. Did you want to respond to that? No, no. I, I was just. I just said. You know, that's that's part of it as well. You also had a, 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 a particular point of view, which is well, we may not want to uh, coexist peacefully with Israel, but given the power disparity. It's, it's something we'll have to learn to live with. And, and as Norm um, points out, those people will now be looking at the equation and say, well, maybe it's, uh, maybe it's different. Israel is vulnerable. Israel can be defeated. Will Israel survive a prolonged war of attrition um, on, on multiple fronts and so on? That's why I'm very, very skeptical about any possibility of this conflict ending soon. Mm -hmm. Because Israel's most um, central goal has always been, from the point of view of foreign policy uh, internationally, has been to maintain what it calls its deterrence capacity, mm -hmm. namely the Arab world's fear of it. And after October 7th, its deterrence capacity collapsed. It was the iron a, wall melted. Yes. Hmm. It was a catastrophe. And they're now in a state of complete panic. They can't seem to be able to inflict a military defeat on Hamas. They are being mocked and taunted and also at war, low-level war, but still war, with Hezbollah in the north, which means on every front and in totality, their deterrence capacity has been reduced to a near zero. And genocide and, hasn't restored it. And, and genocide hasn't restored it. And so they are going to do what it takes because that's their primary goal, to restore their deterrence capacity. The Did Arab world see, fear of it. The only hope is that the U.S. cuts it off. Did any of you happen to see that, um, I guess you could call it a protest, where some of the families of hostage victims broke into some, mm -hmm. it looked like a roundtable meeting, and they had to be dragged out, and they were screaming, you know, criti criticisms of Netanyahu and saying, we can live, we can live. We can live with Palestinians. We can we can live with them. You're the you're the bigger obstacle. We need our families home. Did you did you, did you, any of you see that yeah, clip? I, I, wa I watched it. I watched it. It made me a little bit sad that our side hasn't found that kind of courage. Not that young people haven't been fantastic. They've been fantastic, but breaking into the Congress oh. and doing what these folks did. <laughs> They, went right into the they, they did disrupt Blinken's uh, testimony to Congress early on, you know, holding up. Yeah, uh, I mean, I see it less. Them. I see it less of an indictment of anybody in America says. Oh, no, I mean, I just, there's certainly many more. I mean, 400,000 people in the most recent protest oh, in D.C. There's so oh, many more. I mean, frankly, the the volume of the protests in Israel has oh, been dude. pretty meager. Although I don't <laughs> them it's either. Not. Because it's, it's so much, it's so stigmatized there, and you know there's so much authoritarianism in terms of people, his, te history teachers getting arrested for Facebook yeah. posts and things like that. So no judgment on either side, but just to the extent that there is a kind of radicalization, perhaps on the Arab side of this equation, saying, well, Israel is perhaps more vulnerable now than we understood, and we're going to be less compromising. I think it's interesting to consider whether or not on the other side in Israel there are perhaps more uh, there's perhaps a softening to the idea that the only way peace is going to come 
is through compromise because they do see themselves as vulnerable. They do are starting to I see that so. as making them more uh, vulnerable. And at least the people who are directly connected to the hostages. Um, hostages certainly see um, the stated policy of Netanyahu's government as making them or at least their family members less safe. And I, I'm not trying to pretend that there's some enormous sea change happening in Israel, but even that level of demonstration and even that level of rhetoric seem to be very unique and a departure from much of what we've seen before. Not to mention there were the protests earlier in the year, earlier last year before um October 7th, that were pretty historic in nature. Again, not exactly liberal bastion or anything, but a strong condemnation of the extreme right-wingness of the Likud government. There, there have been precedents for that in when Israel occupied South Lebanon, uh, approaching the year 2000, there were large numbers of Israeli soldiers who were being killed. And then there was a mother's movement formed in Israel. Four the mothers, I think it was called initially. I can't hear you. Four mothers, I think it was oh, called initially. Yeah, it was mothers who demanded the withdrawal from South Lebanon, and that gradually ballooned, and it was considered one of the precipitous, precipitant factors in the decision in uh, July, June or July 2000, July, I think, right, uh, to withdraw from uh, Israel's occupying Lebanon uh, from 1983, really from 1978, actually, uh, and that uh, forced the withdrawal. Uh, my view is, as you know, right now, there's talk about a deal being brokered in which there would be a two-month ceasefire and Israel, excuse me, Hamas would give up all the hostages in exchange for a two-month ceasefire. Uh, I find that very improbable. Uh, Netanyahu is facing, as you just pointed out, huge domestic pressure over the hostages because most of the people were shouting at the legislators, what if it were your children? What would you do if it was your family? Mm -hmm. And uh, highly personalizing it. So there is huge domestic pressure to get the hostages back. So I do think Israel will say that there will be a two-month ceasefire if the hostages are returned. But the moment the hostages are returned, there will be near perfect unanimity to bomb Gaza into the Stone Age to restore that deterrence capacity and to destroy Hamas and that will include all those parents who were shouting in the Knesset, right. in my view. So as you all know, it's very easy to fabricate an excuse. So the moment the hostages are freed, you will recall in 1939 when Hitler needed an excuse to invade Poland, he fabricated a border incident. So he had his pretext for invading Poland, our country, 1964, the Gulf of Tonkin incident, another fabrication. That's a long history. So they will just fabricate the moment the hostages are released, the domestic pressure is released, lifted, and they will destroy Gaza. So and very the, the polls show that people, even people who don't support Netanyahu, support his use of force against Gazans. Um, I just wanted to, you guys have been so generous with your time. I want to ask you about one final thing, which is that um, this weekend, uh, Hamas put out a document. It's kind of like almost an explainer. I think it's a 16 page document. That's almost like an explainer on October 7th and also an explainer on uh, Hamas itself. Uh, I wanted to know what you guys thought of that document and if there was anything that you found noteworthy in it. Um, who, who's, uh, the question to, uh, you or Norman, when or, you go, I guess, uh, I've read it. Or Bray I, was, too. I, I thought it was an interesting, um, document because if you look at Hamas propaganda generally, and particularly since, um, October, uh, 7th, it, it has been very much directed at, um, domestic public opinion. Um, Arab public opinion, and to a lesser extent at seeking to 
um, influence um, Israeli public opinion. What I thought was different about this text, it was uh, published in both Arabic and in English translation, is that Hamas um, also seeks to address an international audience, which is something that as a rule, um, they have refrained uh, from doing, and when they have done it, have not done particularly well. On, on this occasion, um, I think they were trying to send several messages. First of all, explaining the context of October 7th. In other words, history did not start on October 7th. Um, there's, there's a whole uh, context there that, that led Hamas to the conclusion that it had um, no alternative to conducting these attacks. Um, secondly, it spent a considerable number of time seeking to refute many of the most lurid allegations against um, the movement. You know, for example, featuring um, uh, reports about their actions that have been disproven, such as uh, babies being burnt in ovens and and beheaded. You know, the um, the images Biden saw that don't exist, and so on, and also. Um, uh, strongly rejecting um, the allegations of, of uh, mass rape uh, and, and sexual violence and so on. I mean, they, you know, the, the document states that as a matter of moral and religious principle, Hamas is, is prohibited from attacking civilians. Well, um, that may be true as a moral principle and as a religious principle, but of course Hamas does have a record of um, uh, targeting uh, civilians, for example, during the Second Intifada. So on this occasion, it went out of its way in this document um, to seek to demonstrate that it was primarily um, going after uh, military targets. And then the final part of that document is forward-looking, um, going back to the earlier discussion about the Houthis, um, here uh, Hamas makes the point um, that we are not fighting Jews uh, and we are not fighting Israelis because of their Jewish faith. Um, we are fighting Israel because of its Zionist policies. And, and so it makes a clear distinction between Judaism and Zionism. And I think given all the accusations um, that Hamas is a genocidal movement, no different from ISIS, uh, dedicated, you know, to uh, slaughter Jews uh, everywhere. I think they um, they've gotten the message that these are the accusations against them, and they seek to um, uh, refute them. And they basically um, uh, finally emphasize that the only solution here is um, implementation of the Palestinian right to self-determination, uh, uh, ceasefire, holding Israel accountable. And crucially, they call on the International Criminal Court to investigate all allegations, um, right. and not just uh, those uh, against their enemies. Um, and there was one more point about, um, uh, about the conclusion. Oh, and they make the point that no leadership can be imposed upon the Palestinians. And this is their response to all these various day after scenarios that are premised on removing um, Hamas from the equation and from any participation in Palestinian political life. They say, I just want to quote them because it'll be uh, ignored, but I think it's relevant. Uh, Hamas affirms that its conflict is with the Zionist project, not with the Jews because of their religion. Hamas does not wage a struggle against the Jews because they are Jewish, but wages a struggle against the Zionists who occupy Palestine. Yet it is the Zionists who constantly identify Judaism and the Jews with their own colonial project and legal entity. It sounds like something I'd say on the show and have said on the show, <laughs> which I'm sure people will use against me. Well, maybe uh, you're the author of the document. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> there were a couple of mistakes uh, that, that suggested it wasn't English as a first language, so it wasn't just make, just make sure you secured your royalties. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm on the Hamas would, payroll. I'd make two comments, always being a stickler for the facts. I was looking very carefully in the first part. Do they get their numbers right? 
and do they get you know elementary factual questions right because notoriously they never did but this time the numbers were right actually believe it or not in some cases the numbers were understated hmm. when you compare it to conventional estimates of various things so that was i thought a good thing to see that they were uh they were trying to uh be precise and accurate um the second thing is the point Mawin said, which is actually a very surprising thing, I have to say, namely this issue of them saying, we will cooperate with the ICC, we will yeah. cooperate with investigative bodies. This came up during the current round when the attack occurred in Al Ali Hospital. And uh, Human Rights Watch wrote, put out a report that said the evidence seems to support the claim that that attack was caused by Hamas, a misfired Hamas rocket. <clears throat> and I do know a person in Hamas. And so I emailed him to ask whether he would support an international investigation to confirm who was responsible for that. And his reply came as a surprise to me. He said, yes, of course, yes, of course. And of course I ran with that and began to ask Human Rights Watch, why didn't you conduct an investigation in cooperation with Hamas? You say Hamas has critical evidence. You say that, or everybody says, examining the, the actual site of the landing of the rocket, is critical to determining who was responsible. Well, Hamas says, we'll let you look at our evidence. We'll let you look at the site. They said, yes, of course. And I was surprised here that again, they said, yes, we're not afraid. We're not afraid. I, I would have been, frankly, I would have been afraid because there can't really be any doubt, I don't think, but feel free to agree, disagree with me, that atrocities, Hamas atrocities did occur on October 7th. Or am I wrong about that, Moeen? No, uh, that, that sounds right. I think um, probably uh, their perspective is, first of all, that Israel has much more to lose um, than does Hamas. I mean, when is the last time um, that a Hamas leader um, changed plans to go on a shopping spree in London or Paris because of fear of arrest. Um, that's uh, number one. And number two, if they were seen to be obstructing an international investigation, that would make things very difficult for them domestically as well. They also point out in their document uh, that the, the way that Israel has allegedly the way Israel allegedly killed people on October 7th. They go through those different yes. claims. Yeah, they the actually tanks. called it, believe it or not, Israeli one newspapers. of the central sources, one of, no, one of the central sources, brace yourself, was Mondo Weiss. Oh, yeah, Mondo yeah. Weiss, yeah. And you, and some, and some Israeli newspapers as well, yeah. It's, it's quite, if I may, it's, it's, it's quite possible that um, they have concluded that the, they don't deny that there were killings of civilians. Right. They just they deny like mistakes responsibility for them. They say either it was Israelis or unruly elements or right. crossfire. It's possible that they're genuinely convinced um, uh, that's the case. But I assume there are some people with responsibility for, for the release of this report that know better and nevertheless felt that a um, impartial, thorough investigation um, would make the Israelis look very, very much worse right. uh, than it does. In come. contrast, well, look yeah. who's being accused of genocide in the world's eyes court. I'll make. I want to hear Bianca. Yeah, go ahead, Bianca. I was going to say, in contrast, that with uh, Israel, which has refused to cooperate right. with any UN investigation into allegations of sexual assault by Hamas on October seventh. Exactly. Yeah. Right. I'm going to just leave off one why. comment. I would just be curious to hear the reaction. I had a visitor yesterday. He was Palestinian. 
He's a cardiologist. He lives in Germany. He was in New York for a conference at Princeton. And I asked him about the question of the rapes. What's his opinion on what happened in that regard? And his answer was, it's impossible that they committed the rapes for the following reason. He said, because that particular crime is, is viewed with such revulsion in Arab Muslim or Palestinian society that if any person came back and it became known that he had committed a rape, he would be totally ostracized in Gazan society and he could never ever have a wife. It could not happen. What do you I, think? I, Go you ahead. Know, I I don't I don't put too much store in these um, uh, cultural explanations for why something um, did or uh, didn't happen. Um, as we know, um, sexual violence and and armed conflict are are bedfellows, uh, so to speak. Transcultural. And, and 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 I I find it entirely plausible that there was uh, sexual violence. Um, the real question I think or, um, that 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 needs to be investigated is whether there was mass organized sexual violence because right, that's, that's really the allegation right. that's being you know no um, the New York Times and and Israeli spokespeople and so on um, are 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 not condemning the Palestinians because one or two or 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 three uh, Palestinians had entered into Israel on October 7th, uh, participated in or, or conducted acts of sexual violence. They're saying this was widespread, right. systematic, and organized. Exactly. And that I, I, I personally haven't seen any evidence for it. Um, I don't think there is any evidence for it. So let's have an investigation. Um, and if Israel insists on not cooperating with an investigation, I think the stories should be not about Israel's allegations, but about Israel's refusal to cooperate with an investigation. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, there's so many cultures that are that have reputations or kind of self self described narratives of being respectful or more conservative and the like whether it's you know uh, mormons or hasidic jews or whatnot that whose communities have been rife with allegations of sexual misconduct so i also am wary of cultural explanations for it and i wouldn't also damn anybody for being a member of those groups where those kind of revelations have come apart because it is so you uh, come come up because it's so ubiquitous but i also just have never seen the case where someone makes an argument that some group is immune to the vagaries of human existence um, because of some cultural paradigm yeah, just, and that actually I'm, pan out. I'm just repeating what he said. I've said from the beginning that I was agnostic on the question of rapes and the question of beheadings. Beheadings is gone, by the way. If you look at the ICJ hearings, they no, no longer mention the beheading. Yeah. So that's over. And okay, it's, the, it's done its damage. Exactly. exactly. As Muin likes to say, uh, their aim is not to convince you. Their aim is to confuse you. Mm, yeah. If you can sow enough confusion, then you've won. You don't have to convince. And I think that was a shrewd observation uh, by Muin, and I, I kept it. Well, thank, thank you so much. You guys have been so wonderful and so generous with your time. Re love this discussion. Let's do it again. Uh, maybe we can react when the ICJ uh, releases its opinion. And um, where can people find everyone here? Where where can people find you guys? Norm? I live at 2245. <laughs> Stop, Norm. <laughs> You'll get a combo of stalker fans and, and, and haters. Yeah, outside your door. Um, I, I publish um, most of what I what I publish on uh, Jadalia, that's uh, J A D A L I 
yya.com. It's also uh, where my podcast is hosted, and I can also be found on Twitter. Great. You guys are already on YouTube, so you can find uh, me at Bad Faith YouTube. Feel free to subscribe so you don't miss new drops. And also, I'm over at The Hill Monday through Thursdays uh, at The Hills Rising. You can just Google that, where I co-host the show with Robbie Suave. And for more Bad Faith, you can subscribe at patreon.com slash Podcast for an extra episode every week. And, and I'll just, say, just, I'm sorry Crystal didn't make it. Yeah. Uh, there was a help. For whatever issue. reason... Uh, Brianna, uh, Katie, and Crystal have redeemed themselves. It happens to be three women, roughly the same cohort, have redeemed themselves since October 7th. And I feel very good about, at least in that regard, the prospects for the future, uh, that it's never going to happen again, that people will fall silent or everybody will fall silent when these things happen and no doubt will recur um it was a it was a good show i mean i have to say i watch it it could be gripping it could be painful like nails scratching on the blackboard and sometimes it could be just wonderful so oh as we used to say all power to you Thank, Thank you, you very much, uh, so much. for uh, for hosting us. Of course, yeah. Yes. Come Thank, back. Thank you, Katie. You're you're the, the premier host, in my opinion, uh, in our political milieu, and I appreciate you bringing together people together in such wonderful fashion, as you've always done so graciously mm -hmm. and generously. Thank you. And thank you All to right. you both. I've learned a lot from you. And I look forward to talking to both of you more in, in different contexts going forward. Likewise. Thank you very much. Great. Bye, everyone. And I'll stay on and read some of the super chats. Okay. Thanks, guys. This has been great. And thank you, of course, to Brad and Tyler and also to Phantom Fanta for the clips, the real-time clips. And thank you to everyone like Carl Redder, who became a YouTube member. Thank you, Arthur Miller. Thank you. Um, I can't read that name. Uh, if you write it out phonetically, I will. But you gifted 10 Katie Helper memberships. That is so nice. Um, Thank you, Samba Boy, for saying this roundtable is fire. Thank you, Rainy Rose, for your super chat. Uh, Alex Glanz writes, the messenger is on trial now. The message must not be obscured and erased. Never again. Thanks, guys. Um, Sprinkle gave some thing, which seems very nice. I don't know what uh, currency that is, but I like it. Um, thank you, To Be Clear To You who writes PSA free esoteric PDF book, The World Teacher for All Humanity by Benjamin Cream, E22, easy to, ooh, easy to find, profound and insight, seek truth if you want to know, the best is yet to come, but it'll not come easy. Errol C, gifted five Katie Halper memberships. Wow, Brad, we have to start providing people with um those Bodhi emojis. All right, you'll get them soon. Um, Michael Seymour writes in the Ukraine case, the New York times only referred to anonymous sources concerning the Nord Stream sabotage, but went far into deep foraging evidence to prove that the Bucha massacre really took place. Norman Finkelstein, the Socrates of our time. Yes. Uh, Errol gifted 10 Katie Halper memberships. Wow. Um, Norman Socrates Finkelstein, scholar, philosopher, humanist. Wade Worth, thank you. Wade Worth always comes through with those really generous $20. Um, not much debate should have had Robbie Swab on too. Well, this was not uh, billed as a debate, but thank you. The wisdom of this panel is awe-inspiring. Rich, thank you for making us rich. Just kidding. Yoka P, thank you. Um, okay, J Jelperman. Norman, what are the chances Russia and China vote to convict at the ICJ? Charges of hypocrisy be damned. Well, he actually addressed that before uh, on our other stream. Uh, I even made a clip of it that you can look for. Um, I think it has um, Norman Finkelstein on. It has something about Israel's genocidal supporters. I also do, did a short. We also made a short of it. Um, actually, the example Brianna used makes me agree with Norman because if Israelis and the pro-Israel protest movement were advocating a cease. For Hamas, we would be in negotiating negotiations right now. I don't really get that. Sorry. Um, 
No matter what your slogan is, it'll be distorted. I agree with that. Super sticker from Buana. Thank you. I'm from Russia and Russian Jews hate Palestinians. They speak of Palestinians as insects. I don't understand why. Growing up in USSR, we were all taught that racism is bad. That's no good. Uh, never in his a guy speaking rights. Never in history has a state been one created by force. Well, that's not true. A lot of states were created by force. Two maintained by force, sustained itself in the image imagined by its founders. Israel is sealing its own fate. I mean, the United States kind of was founded by force and maintained by force. No, Brad, what do you think? You can give me a head sh shake or nod or shake. Okay, yeah. All right, so a guy speaking, we'll have to debate this another time. Um, where am I now? Um, okay, uh, Plato's beard. Excellent analysis and insights from Bree Moving, Katie, and Norm. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Choosy, heretics, choose, carnation revolution. Thank you for that chat. Um, Jelperman, has anyone seen the footage from Khan Yunis? The IDF left what looks like canned food inside a ruined school, but they're explosives. Oh, I saw that briefly. Oh, disgusting. We'll talk about that next week. Juan Francisco Urusti, Mexican pesos. Uh, thank you for 40. Norman has a guy speaking. Norman has spent a lifetime defending his voluminous scholarship, honesty, and integrity. I'm grateful, but more importantly, Norman's persistence is finally being acknowledged. That's true. Thank you for this wonderful panel. Thanks, Notary S. Have you noticed the U.S. and U.K. begin attacking Yemen uh, on January 12th, right when ICJ began hearing the genocide case against Israel? It was distraction. Ah, good point. New member. Also, another thing to notice and remember, which kind of gets lost, is that with all this talk of Yemen targeting ships, Yemen hasn't killed, the Houthis have not, Ansar al-Allah have not killed anyone, which is crazy. They haven't killed anyone. And yet those are the people that the United States are bombing. Unbelievable. Just unbelievable. Well, thank you guys. We'll be back next Tuesday at our usual time, but I'm really glad we were able to do this. And we're going to have on a doctor who um, is uh, does a lot of amazing work in Palestine. We're also going to have a student activist um, who's getting into a lot of trouble. So it's going to be a great show. Mahmoud writes, hi, Katie, met you last week at People's Forum. You were so nice to me. Yeah, I remember you. Thanks for thanks for um, for stopping by. See, I'm nice to people in real life. Um, and uh, that's it. But that was a oh, it was su such a great time with that live show with Rania Kalik and Abby Martin and Claudia de la Cruz. If anyone's watching and doesn't usually watch my show, please do subscribe. Just hit subscribe and then the bell so you don't miss any of these great streams. Also, please do um, like the stream. It's an effortless way to help the show. And if you can, subscribe to the Patreon. Even if you can just do $1 a month, that's $12 a year. That really helps. That's patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. Again, that's patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. You also get extra uh, content. Like we have some great paywall content about Zionism with uh, Sam Biagetti. Um Really great stuff. So please do become Patreon supporters at patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show and share the videos. All righty. Thank you guys so much. Uh, I don't think I forgot any other announcements. And um, I will see you guys next Tuesday. Bye, everyone. Okay, calm down. You got rivers, man. You got rivers, man.